I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. They're dinosaurs, extinct, but surviving in the form of birds. The last real one appeared in Chicago in 1968. They were decimated shortly thereafter, but they live on, transformed. The National Party conventions and here to engage in some political paleontology and provide some insight and an insider's view of the 2008 Democratic Convention is Ronnie Eldridge. Ronnie, a friend, colleague here at CUNY TV, is host of Eldridge and Company, former New York City Councilwoman, is in Denver next week as an Obama delegate and co-chair of the New York State delegation. Welcome back, Ronnie. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> paleontology, it makes me a relic. No, no, no. You study relics. You are not a relic yourself. I am, but it's all right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you're a relic. This is your third convention as a participant, uh, uh, 72, 92, and now. And you covered it in 76. Let's start with 2008 and work backwards. You're an Obama delegate. How do you become an Obama delegate? How did you become one? Well, some people run in a district, in a right. congressional district. You have to have... Somebody comes in and organizes the state, and you, you're the field director, and you want to, you have to get people to run for delegate and alternate on a slate. You need petition signatures. I don't remember how many. Mm -hmm. I think it's maybe, could it be 2,500? I don't know. Probably less. Per congressional ahead. district. And then when you qualify, your name goes on the ballot on, at the presidential primary. Okay. Then, and the, the Obama people managed to field slates in every one of the congressional right, districts. Right, and did surprisingly well given, well, right. because of the proportional representation right. system. And, and it was, well, the vote too, and it, and it was Hillary's state, so it's right. very complicated. Then, you, there are two votes you make, or there are two votes, or your vote counts for two things. Go ahead. Um, I think you make two votes. Uh, you vote for your candidate. Right. And then you vote for delegates. Okay. And um, I don't think I don't know if you actually vote for delegates. The the number of votes the candidate gets is there's where the proportional right. representation comes right. in determines the number of delegates that get elected. Right. And in each congressional district, it's either it has to be a man in one district and a woman in another district. They have to be equal numbers okay. of everything. So then, if your candidate wins two thirds of the vote, then you get two thirds of the delegate okay. slots. So um, I was an early Obama supporter, and I must say I'm embarrassed to say they asked me if I would run, but I had tried to volunteer. I couldn't find the campaign. I didn't know if there was anybody else working. I just felt I didn't want to go out on a limb and then have to be responsible. Right. So, so I run said, a real campaign. Right. And then I, so I said no. Then we organized, and we did so well in our district that we got the majority of the votes. But then later on— And your on, district is the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Right. In, in Jerry Nadler's congressional okay. district. Then, later on, those votes from the district are, are one kind of delegate. Then you've got superdelegates, which are all the elected officials, right. right? And then you get a certain number of at-large delegates, again, in proportion to, to the, the vote. vote. And I think have to be representative. They have to fill in different quotas. Okay. Gender, race, right. age, Everything. Et Public uh, office holders, this, that. I think that I became a delegate at large because there weren't enough elected officials pledged to Obama. So there was a shortage. So they of had to reach back and they got me. Okay. So, so I was appointed a delegate at large. So okay. I'm going to go. I have the same vote than anybody else, any other delegate. And there are a lot of delegates at large. I don't remember how many, but I think it's about 35. Okay. So you're the co-chair of this delegation. Well, how there many are, co-chairs are about there? I think there are nine co-chairs. Okay, and, and Shelley Silver is the chair of the... Right, that's, and that's, George Mitchell is the honorary chair. Okay. Um, now, what does a co-chair do? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> it's, again, another slot that they had to fill, you know. Okay. But you also get to appoint each candidate represent members to the Credentials Committee, the Rules Committee, and the Platform, platform committee. committee. And you don't have to be a delegate. But if you're members of those committees, of course, you get credentials, which is the prize, so you're able to go on the floor. 
Are you able to go on the floor? Oh, yeah. I'm sitting with the delegation. Okay. Have you gotten any instructions from the Obama people? I mean, what's the information that you've gotten about your role in this convention? You get instructions basically from the state committee. They are and like... And they tell you what? Because we're now a state committee right. operation. They tell you to wear comfortable shoes. Oh, this is important stuff. <laughs> that it gets cold at night. <laughs> that they drink a lot of water because the altitude is high. Uh, uh, wait a minute. Is there any substantive <laughs> political no, stuff here? No. Well, I'm pledged to vote for Obama, but right. actually, I believe that you're not constitutionally pledged to vote for anybody. Right. You can always change your right. mind. So it, well, nobody's going to give me any instructions because I'm a free delegate. I okay. can vote on the platform or I don't have to vote on the platform or I can vote for the vice presidential candidate or I can vote for somebody else. You know, it's that part of it is free. OK. But it's misleading. In no way. <laughs> well, I was a delegate 92 convention. Go ahead. And there I ran. Harold Ickes, who's an old friend of mine from when he was 19 years old, called up and said, would I please run who, in the district? Who was it at the Clinton White he House Clinton. who helped? Yeah, but this is before he got to the White House. Right. It was 92. Right, mastermind right. the Hillary campaign. Right. Anyway, so I ran and I got elected. Again, you ran out of the Upper West Side where right. you lived. Right, and I, you know, I got elected. I actually got elected a Bradley delegate the year that uh, Gore ran. I was an elected Bradley delegate. Was it 1988? Yeah. 1998. 19 something. Whatever. 19 something. I was elected in my district as a Gore, as a Bradley delegate, but I... Oh, right. It would, it would have been 2000. 2000. What am I talking but about? But I didn't want to go to the convention. I mean, there was no point to it. So I, a delegate, a, an alternate filled my spot. Oh, okay. So, so, so you, you could you have... You can been... do that. Okay. And they asked you if you, if something comes up and you can't go, please let us know because we have alternates to fill the spot. Okay. What can so we... what ahead. happens is in the 92 convention is my experience as being a delegate in recent years is that um, all of the elected officials and the big shots of the Democratic Party in New York State, they all congregate around the microphone. You, you know, in the microphone when they say New York State, the Empire State, the beautiful oceans to the mountains and everything else we cast our votes for. So you can't even get near them. And I didn't have the slightest desire to get near them. So I sat in the back row of our delegation next to a woman named Ann Northrup, who was representing ACT UP, and I helped her make the little... <laughs> ribbon pins that we dis that she distributed around. Positive function in that convention. It was uh, a very convention. good thing. It was, um, it, was, it was not a great experience for me. I mean, okay. I wasn't part of the group particularly. I hadn't uh, worked that hard in the campaign. I didn't you know, know a lot of the people. And I just didn't care that much. It was okay. terrible. But this year, there are Obama delegates. And I did work hard in the campaign. And I do have a feeling about the candidate. What's interesting is the difference between now and 72. Which let's go back let, to that. Let's, let's, the, before we get to 72, which I want to spend some time with, we're going to watch this convention next week. What, sh what should we expect? Well, or you, what should we expect, know that we're not going to get? You're going to expect speeches. You That's know. it. Uh, basically. We're, we're not going to expect a now. platform fight. No. It's going to be, no. it's going to be kumbaya, right? right? The, um, Nowadays, with, with cable covering, and I don't know if they'll be gavel to gavel, but, you know, I grew up with conventions. I loved listening to them on the radio. I, I, you know, and they were gavel to gavel. They started early and they went late. What was late. the first convention you remember listening to? I remember to? Quincy Howe. I think it was Wendell Wick Wilkie. Quincy Howe saying, I've run, it was going so long, I've run out of blue shirts. Will my wife please send me more? <laughs> That's I'll never forget that. So and this I is the, loved that. I guess part the of it. 1940 election. Wow, I'm, we're not going to get can't be 40. Right it must have been later than okay. that. whatever, whoever it was. I don't okay. remember. Um, but they were give and take. You know, they were. There was a lot of bargaining, and it lasted. It went to the floor, and they were platform. Well, the platform fights really that I participated in were over Vietnam. Okay, and that let's let's go to 72 then. You are a delegate. You are. On the platform committee, you're a, how did you get to... I wasn't a delegate. You, I was a member of the platform committee. I was, I was supporting John Lindsay. I worked for John Lindsay at that time. Who had and he was running party, for president. And right. he you know, ran right. the primaries, did very poorly. As and, a candidate, I guess, having gone to a certain point and receiving a, a certain number of votes, he was able to point, because these people are appointed early on, or they were in those days, members to the platform committee and stuff. And I was a re the representative to the platform committee. Okay. So I went, the, in those days, the, the platform committee had hearings around the country, not too many, 
the Obama people had a great program of initiating over 1,600 local little platform hearings. Anyway, I went to those, and then we met in Washington just before the convention, I think, you know, the days before the convention. And it was days. Richard Neustadt from, he was up at the Kennedy right. Institute of Politics. Presidential scholar. He was the chair of the platform committee, and I had met him during Robert Kennedy's presidential campaign, which incidentally never got far enough to really elect delegates. Right. Um, so, uh, now, I just realized something that's interesting. But anyway, so he, he nominated me to be vice chair. And it was just a, a funny personal story because I was sitting next to my friend Bella Abzug, who by that time was in Congress. And she objected to me being, she was one of my close friends. I was one of her closest advisors. I'm sitting next to her at the, at the platform committee hearing. She objected to me being co-chair because she said um, she wanted to be co-chair. And then a Latino. And then, so then we compromised and we had about five co chairs representative. Right. It sounds like this, uh, the <laughs> chairs of the delegation. I was also on the drafting committee. And that's a more select group of the platform. The platform committee is, oh, is almost 200 people. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can't really write a platform with 200 people. Sure. So then they narrow it down. And I guess each candidate had a person. I'm not quite sure how that worked. But I was the Lindsay person on that drafting committee. Mm -hmm. And of course, there ensued a fight because we were very conscious of everything in those days. But we, were, but nothing was determined by uh, actual requirements as they are now. Right. So there was no Latino on the platform committee, and all hell broke loose. So I decided to give my seat up in a, in a Latino. But I had been to two of the meetings, and they were very interesting. And I actually made some longtime friends from all that negotiation. But then they divided it up to planks. So there's one for. Uh, health, one for housing, one for civil right. rights, one, uh, and I think I became the head of the welfare plank. So then <clears throat> we met separately, other members of the platform committee, to draft this welfare pl plank. You know, out of a, to almost 200 people, there were people who sure. wanted to go there. And that happened with all the different planks. And these discussions went on for hours. Hours. Well, that was a convention that just went on and on. I mean, McGovern gave his acceptance speech in the wee hours well, of the Well, the platform morning. committee met, meeting, first of all, went on and on. Um, and people got up and we made outrageous proposals, but it was wonderful. I mean, it was the time for every progressive person to get everything they wanted into the platform. So we were to George Wiley of the welfare rights people. They were very organized for that platform. The housing people were very, everybody was very organized. Well, there was organized. a lot of conflict here. Absolutely. So then the platform committee as a whole meets, and I think ours was in the middle of the night, and we go plank by plank to approve it or disapprove it. I remember I was sitting next to, I think it was Robert Novak, who was so cynical even then. And he starts commenting about how we're going to lose everything because we're crazy at the things we're putting on the platform. So we adopted a platform. So let's talk about crazy. Then, yeah. then you go to the convention. Wait a minute. That, no, that no, was no. the convention. And the difference is that I didn't have the personal loyalty to McGovern. I liked McGovern. But I had been for Lindsay, mm -hmm. and I got caught up, as most of the women did, in wanting a woman for vice president. Mm -hmm. And he had chosen Eagleton, and, right. we, and we had a strong women's Didn't caucus. Have, have Sissy we had Farron, Sissy Farenthal, right. state senator from, from Texas. Right. And we really staged a fight. So it was that fight, and I'm sure that peace people had a stronger, but although the plank was very strong. But we had so many arguments and discussions on the floor of the convention that you're right. George McGovern didn't get to make his speech until 2 o'clock in the morning, and then everybody was asleep. Okay. And just a little historical background. It stemmed from the 1968 convention, the, the chaotic, right. now that riotous was, convention. And then you have the McGovern-Fraser commission that is meant to reform the party, but in a sense, the commission it it revolutionizes so right. and it changed the, the whole thing. It got rid of all the bosses because 68 showed daily, you know, yelling at Ribicoff. But let me just go back to 68 because that was an interesting time. Bella was had run for Congress, but I think by then, but Bella was heading was Women's Strike for Peace. And we had met through somebody, Al Lowenstein. And we decided, the anti-war movement, we decided, Bella and I, that we should make the delegate, the people running for delegate, pledge themselves to vote against the war. Nobody had ever done that before. Mm -hmm. That was the first time you started to attach 
political things to delegates. Okay. Right? And it was very interesting. And we did that. We, we got everybody to really make statements and all that kind of stuff. I remember uh, traveling with uh, Sorensen, Ted Sorensen, um, to her committee, actually. He was running as a Kennedy delegate. And he shocked everybody when he told them that he was a conscientious objector during this, you know, the Korean War, whenever it was. Anyway, so that was an interesting time. And I think that was the beginning of a lot of the arguments on substance right. at the convention. Okay. So you've got the, the change in the party, and in a sense, the, the, the whole nature of American presidential politics changes. Now you've got a very candidate-centered, primary-centered system where the bosses are really shut out. Then you go to the 72 and 76 elections, and then after the 80 elections, you've got a rebound. So what was the reform earlier? You've got some pullback. So you have the Hunt Commission, which now puts the party back in with the superdelegates. Right. So what one generation's <laughs> reform is another right. problem to be right. reformed. Now, you look at the conventions today, and you look at the last several conventions, they're all scripted media events. They're not, they're not what they once were. Do they have a function? No, they're public relations functions. I mean, I, we saw that with the Kerry. Uh, and, Is that and, important? I mean, what role I do think it's important because it's the play? start of the election campaign. Okay, so one, it kicks off the general right. election campaign. What else does it do? Um, it's supposed to define the party, but people really don't know what the, what the platforms, I think, are. Um, and it gives some visibility to the vice presidential candidate. You know, in the old days, you didn't know who the delegates were going to vote for, so there was tension on the floor. Right. And you, you, didn't, you knew some of the big bosses, but you didn't know what was going on within the delegations. I remember once uh, with Stevenson that Stanley Lowell was... A this is either, what, 52, 56? This is back with, yeah, yeah, where he missed a vote because he was basically supporting, I don't remember. Anyway, he missed a vote, and the local Democratic Club was so angry at him. He said he was in the men's room. It was some argument I didn't even understand. But anyway, so you didn't know how delegates were going to vote. And it made it a lot of tension because they didn't have primaries. You didn't know who was leading in the count, so that was it. And now you, And you weren't pledged, and now right. you know. Yeah, well, now you know the votes, right. You know the votes before you go in. You know the candidate. We're waiting for the candidate to tell us who the vice president was. It used to be that the vice president was a bargaining point with states, you know. Right, I mean, and, and the delegates, Kennedy was uh, as you suggest, were able to negotiate right. for their vote. They were able right. to trade right. for their vote. Now you can't. No. So what do you expect? Well, you see, diff it's, a, it's an attempt to solidify the parties between the different candidates and their supporters. So it's got, it's got the unifying function within the party. It's rewarding people who've been loyal in one way or another to the party and to the candidate because that's who the people get the speeches. Or it's mending fences or trying to make friends. That's another reason people get to speak. I mean, Obama was highlighted four years ago, and that's what started his campaign. And now the Clintons are going to speak because, you know, the Obama people want the Clinton people to... To coalesce. Yeah. And also it provides, I think, a, an introduction or a reintroduction of the candidates to what is now going to be a general election electorate. Right, right. Absolutely. It's a different electorate. So even though they've been transformed and, in a sense, lost their historical functions, they're still... You seem to be suggesting that they're still vital in some way to well, American presidential parties, politics. But now, now what's interesting is we got an invitation from a, a law firm that lobbies. And on the back Who's of the... Who's we? Jimmy and I. Okay. Jimmy Breslin, yeah. your husband. My husband is going to write, cover the convention for Newsday oh, and the Denver Post. It makes me a little scared, but anyway. Uh, wait a minute. Wait. <laughs> just as an aside, what does that make you nervous? Because he says outrageous things and I get embarrassed, you know. <laughs> Anyway, uh, we got an invitation. On the back of the invitation, it said, this, um, this party has been informally discussed and approved by the House so-and-so committee. If you want to have further discussions, call this number, and it's a Washington number at the Congress, at the House of Representatives. And then it says, the Senate, Senate Ethics Committee has approved this party. That's all because of all the new ethics rules okay. uh, about what you can accept if you're an elected official. And that's, that's the impact of the superdelegates. I mean, that's what's so interesting. It okay. goes, you know, round and round. Okay. Now, who's the VP? I have no idea. Do you, do you have a preference? Do you have a preference? 
I have a preference, but he's not being discussed as one of the major. Okay, so the, who's being discussed? Biden's being discussed. Kane's being discussed. I like Biden. If of and the people who are being discussed, I keep hoping who's the, maybe. Who's the, there's a third one that's being discussed. Bye. I'm bye. Um, I'm hoping uh, if it was somebody outside, it would be Rendell from the state of Pennsylvania. Why? Why? Why because Rendell? Because he's such a wonderful politician, and he was a strong Clinton supporter. Pennsylvania is a very important state. He has this warmth. He is an old-fashioned but modern politician. He just—he's my picture of a good politician. Okay, uh, but but I don't. He doesn't bring foreign policy experience, which people say they think the candidate. Well, wants. if it's only foreign policy experience, it's Biden. Yeah. Although I have the feeling that this president is going to pay a lot of attention to foreign policy. He's not going to delegate that to anybody else. So I just don't know. I have no idea. I don't know. We'll find out in a couple of days. I'm an Obama supporter, so I got on the network, you know, on on, on an email that if I want to know, just push this button, which is a very clever campaigning right. thing because it gives them more resources. Um, I wanted to go back. I also went to the last Republican convention that had a little bit of a floor fight. What, the 1988 and, convention? Yeah, I think it was that. The, when, Bush, the Bush one convention. Right. When there, uh, that was the em emergence, in my mind, of the religious right. I mean, they were out in full well, Robertson, force. Robertson, I think, ran during Something, the primaries yeah. in 88. They were out in such force with all their signs and their prayer meetings and everything else. But the women in the Republican Party, the more progressive women, staged a floor fight on the right on choice. And I don't think that's happened since. I, I don't think, think there's been a floor fight in either of the two conventions right. since, and since, since. And everything. That, and, that, and that was put down rather, rather quickly. You mentioned earlier one of the things that the conventions have done, in a sense, has projected some of their speakers into the national limelight. I mean, you have Obama in 2004, Buchanan, I guess, in 1992, and certainly Mario Cuomo, his 1984 convention speech catapulted him and, in fact, made him the Front runner in '92 be, before he decided, with the plane, you know, running, you know, the engines running on the Albany Airport. Hamlet on the Hudson decides to stay home, and then he nominates Clinton for the presidency. Who's the keynote speaker this year? I've forgotten now. I'm totally. Uh, we don't know. Uh, no, it's Kane. 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 Right. Governor of uh, <laughs> a new governor. New governor new, of new Virginia, so-called purple state. Right. You know. um, with Mario's position, with Cuomo's position on abort, on choice, is that he's personally opposed to abortion, but he would uphold. He's a the Catholic. Law, so, the law. I mean, and that's making that's a very important part of the electorate. That's exactly right. And one part of the electorate that the republic uh, the the Republicans have, you know, sort of owned since 1980, because you know, because but a lot of those Catholics are Reagan Democrats. But it's evangelicals almost more than Catholics. I mean, when you take a poll on how people feel about choice it's not overwhelmingly against it isn't it Am no you're not right yeah. no but it's the evangelicals who are really so strong. well there are other issues that have to do with that so you've got Cain giving the keynote we don't know who the vp is and you've got obama talking before 70 75 thousand people i mean clearly no matter what happens in this election the Republican convention just can't be as interesting. Well, the Republican convention is never as interesting, at least not to me. Well, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I'm, I'm but, saying too uh, much myself. It is a historic moment. It is an you're gonna, absolutely you're gonna, historic moment. You're going to be moment. witnessing. I mean, it, something that, you know, when I was in college, we went to Washington for a government trip. We couldn't stay at the same hotel that my friend went for weeks could. She was, black. she was black. She wanted to go on the trip. So we said, then we found out she couldn't stay at that now, hotel. Now, where are you coming from? Barnard College. We found that we couldn't stay at the Y with her. The Y was segregated. Oh, God. This is in 50, 51. Everything in the capital of the country was a segregated city. And now we're going to have an African-American president 50 years ago. It seems like that, of course. 50 years ago seems to me like yesterday, but it's But we not. really are at a profound moment here. I mean, you've got the potential, I hate to sound like a political scientist, of a dramatic realigning election here. In or, the world also, in the world. Right. Because as we increasingly face an, all these new countries and emerging nations and powers, I mean, people of color are certainly the majority of the people in the world. You've been an, an enthusiastic Obama supporter right now, you know, a week before the convention. How do you feel about this election? What does your gut tell you? 
I never believe anything until it happens, so I'm nervous, and I hope everybody will go out and work very hard. Um, I, I, um, and I think a lot of it is an act of faith. That's what I really wanted to tell you. Uh, now, if there was a proposed floor fight, I wouldn't join it because I want Obama to be nominated. Okay. The and you don't want any distractions. I don't want any distractions. I'm I'm supporting him on good f with with the faith that he's going to do what I expect him to do. But I want him to get elected, and I feel so personally committed that I don't want to see any floor fight. I don't want to see any dissension. I just want to see him nominated, which is such a difference from previous experiences. Interesting. And in fact, uh, the fact that both Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton have prominent speaking roles, in a sense, you know, they, they had Obama hostage, and he's, you know, this is, this is the ransom. I, what, what, did, what comes out of this convention with the Clintons? They come out like gangbusters supporting Obama, and they go all out? I hope so. But campaigning? I, I'm not. You know, today there was a story that Bill Clinton said they were both both candidates were good on the environment. I don't know. Bill doesn't like <laughs> Obama. There's something there. Yeah. Is, is it is it something? I have problem? no idea. Have I don't no know. Idea. I don't know. And well, interesting enough, I'm a very strong Obama delegate. I don't know. I've never met Obama. I don't know anybody. Basically, I mean, I know some of the kids and a few people like that in the campaign. I don't know Axelrod. I don't know any of them. But I'm just in there plugging like everybody else. And it's just a leap of faith, but I think it's very. Let, let, me, let me pose a distasteful alternative to you. Obama loses the general election. Where are we? I think we're in a lot of trouble. I don't know. I just, I can't imagine. I, I think it'll be repercussions unlike any other election, don't you think? I'm, I'm, I'm the host. I'm asking you the questions. No, yes, I, 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 I agree. I mean, you know, as well as being an analyst and, you know, a professor, I am a political person. And it's damn it. It'll be very damn it. I mean, we have all these young people, all these new voters, plus the whole question of race, which, of course, is the basis of so much in this campaign. So this could be a critical election sort of in the negative sense, that if it doesn't happen, that there are, in your mind, serious negative repercussions. Yeah, I think so. So? I don't know. We don't know. We better work hard. <laughs> you better do your job. Right. We will talk again. All right. And when you, when you get back, let's talk. All right. I hope my feet won't hurt, and I hope I've acclimated to the climate. And um, it's a lot of work and a lot of, you know, they send out all these parties and everything else. But I just think I'm going to get very tired. <laughs> uh oh. But you're going to have fun. Yeah, I and hope so. And you're going to so. be part of history. I hope so. Good. We'll talk. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.